Hello, Datin. <laughs> <laughs> yes, good evening. Good evening, it's on. Yeah. All right, so before we start, I will just read a bio um, of you uh, so that everyone has a good background of who you are. I've decided to go with the official biography, um, bio data in case I, you know, miss say some things. Um, <laughs> so you just oh have to, <laughs> so you have to sit through this. So Marina Mate is a writer, women's rights and HIV AIDS activist and TV producer. She served as the president of the Malaysian AIDS Council for 12 years from 1993 to 2005. In addition, Marina has served on many regional and international HIV AIDS bodies including the AIDS Society of Asia and the Pacific, ASAP, UN AIDS and the Asia Pacific Leadership Forum on HIV and Development, APLF. Currently, she is a member of the Board of Sisters in Islam, which advocates for justice and equality for Muslim women. She is also a member of the International Advisory Group of Musawah, the global movement for justice and equality in the Muslim family. Marina has written a fortnightly column on social issues in a local English language daily for more than 20 years, which you guys should read, and writes and speaks regularly on current issues, particularly when it relates to gender, human rights and religion. Between 2001 and 2009, she was co-executive producer of an award-winning TV program for young women, 3R, Respect, Relax and Respond, and resumed that role in the new 3R series that began broadcasting in 2013. She was a time an avid blogger with her own blog, Rantings by mm.blogspot.com, a Twitterer at N-E-T-R-A-K-L, and a Facebooker. She has authored three books, In Liberal Doses, in 1997, and Telling It Straight, 2012, and compilations of her newspaper columns and 50 Days Rantings by M MM in 2009. In 2010, Marina was named the UN Person of the Year by the United States in Malaysia. United Nations, United Nations sorry. <laughs> On the occasion of the 100th anniversary of International Women's Day in 2011, Marina was one of the only two Malaysian women named to WomenDeliver.org's list of 100 most inspiring people delivering for girls and women. In 2014, Marina received a Doctorate of Letters Honoris Causa from Wawasan Open University, Penang. Marina also sits on the board of the Maybank Foundation, the Malaysian Philharmonic Orchestra and the Dewan Philharmonic of Petronas and is a member of the Board of Trustee of the Asian University for Women in Chittagong, Bangladesh. She has also set up a website for women travellers called zafigo.com in 20, November 2013, the Prime Minister appointed Marina as a member of the National Unity Consultative Council, NUCC, that is tasked with finding ways to promote unity among Malaysians. In 1997, Marina was awarded the, Dat the Datuk Paduka Makota Selangor by His Royal Highness, the Sultan of Selangor, which carries the title Datin Paduka. Whew. A bit long. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. So I decided that we're going to start in the beginning because it's a really good place to start. Um, <laughs> how did you first get involved in social activism? Um, really uh, by accident. Um, it's not something that I woke up one day and decided I was going to do something. Um, uh, I was always interested in um, social issues but uh, in the early days of my working life, I didn't do much beyond um, supporting you know, women's causes mostly here and there. But during uh, the working life, I started off as a journalist. Um, I picked up a lot of skills, um, organizing skills, PR skills, mass comm skills. I worked in PR for a while. And later on, I found all these skills and I worked on some really big uh, projects, event uh, organizing projects. So later on, I realized that I could use all these skills uh, for, to help out some social cause. So the first um, charitable event I did was way back in, I think it was something like 89 or 90 probably, uh, where I organized uh, something called Fashion Aid to raise funds for the famine in Ethiopia mm. and also for, for the war in Bosnia, you know, well, to support the, the victims of the war in Bosnia. And I think that's how 
uh, people realized that I knew how to organize and I could raise funds, etc. And that's how I came to be invited to join the Malaysian AIDS Foundation. And then it went on from there. Because that was going to be my second question. Why, uh, how did you end up um, becoming a social activist for HIV AIDS? Again, by accident. I mean, I really, really didn't wake up one day and decide uh, that's what I wanted to do. I um, was very, very aware uh, that there was an HIV problem globally. And um, I had some friends who, who were HIV positive and who had died of AIDS. And I always thought that I wanted to do something. Um, and uh, it so happened, um, and, I, and, and I think my own life is filled with that, uh, it so happened um, that um, I got a call uh, from uh, a friend of mine who is a long time uh, women's group activist who said, oh Marina, uh, we've just formed the Malaysian AIDS Foundation, uh, the board of trustees for that, and we don't have enough women. So, would you like to come and join? So I went, and I went to the first meeting, and by the end of the night, I was the chair, um, which I realized that it, that that was something that they had planned already. I didn't I didn't quite realize it, but um, but I thought that wow, it's funny because I was thinking about this problem, and suddenly this opportunity uh, came to me, and must mean something. So. I took it up uh, without really, this was 1993, without really knowing what I could do for it uh, and how far I would go. Um, and I only knew that, and, and all they knew of me too, was that I knew how to raise funds. And that's what they wanted. And, um, and then it went on from there, really. Yeah. I think a lot of people can relate that it just so happened. Um, or that aha uh -huh, and that thing just fell on your lap and you just took right. it up and run with it. So growing up, were you a bit of a rebel? Um, no, not at all. I'm a very good girl. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, um, I mean, I grew up in a little town. I grew up in Alosta, which is really, really small. Anybody from Kedah here? Yay! Ada orang Kedah juga. I, you know, it's a small town, there wasn't much going on, um, so yeah, there's nothing to rebel against. I heard that in Alostar everyone knows everyone. Uh, I guess pretty much, it's pretty small. Um, my dad, of course, was uh, a, d a doctor and seems like a lot of people went to him, so yeah, so everyone knew him. <laughs> So when you're talking about, you know, you, you've joined the Malaysian AIDS Foundation in 1993. In social act, from, from a social activism point of view, how has things changed from 1993 to now? Not much. Really? Well, some things have changed. Um, 1993, um, there were, you know, people didn't know much about HIV. People didn't want to talk about it. There was a lot of taboo. Uh, about talking about it. So I think now um, people will talk about AIDS, not always very intelligently or in an informed way, but anyway, they'll talk about it. Um, and I think people have a, a lot more um, informed view of it, uh, I think. In the old days, it was only those people who got HIV. Now they know that you know, women get it, babies get it, lots of people get it. Um, one thing that's changed definitely um, during my time, and I'm pretty proud of it, is that we went from 1993, when there's absolutely no treatment for HIV, um, to a time when treatment came, and, uh, but uh, there wasn't access to it here in Malaysia because it was so expensive. So we advocated uh, for the drugs to be um, either the government forced the drug companies to reduce the prices or, or um, start bringing in generics. Um, so uh, I think out of fear of the generics coming in, the drug companies did actually reduce the price and also the government agreed to provide free HIV treatment, free first-line 
HIV treatment to any Malaysian who has HIV for life. Wow. So that's, that's really something because not many countries uh, did that at the time. Um, the other thing that uh, we managed to do, which is quite amazing for a country like ours, is that the government agreed to start um, what we call harm reduction programs, which means needle exchange mm. programs for drug users and methadone replacement therapy for drug users. Quite radical. Yeah. Um, but uh, they agreed to do it and, and it was done. I'm not sure what the status of it and I'm not sure that we've scaled up enough for it to make a difference. But it does exist, so it's quite something. Yeah. Yeah, there's two things that was brought up that I became very interested about as I was reading everything about you when I was researching the question. One is around going, going, taking on a topic that's taboo, um, especially back in the days, right? And the second is really going against the, the status quo. So I understand that back then the, syringe, the needle exchange program was actually um, against the law. Is that correct? Yeah, well, the, the drug laws are such that if you are caught with a syringe, uh, it is assumed that you're a drug user, and therefore, wow. yeah, and therefore uh, you can be cut it off to rehab. Um, and so we had a big problem with our uh, workers, our social workers who go on the streets and had clean uh, needles and syringes to give to drug users to stop them from sharing needles and the police would stop them and that, that would cause all sorts of uh, problems. But uh, we, we didn't overnight uh, set up this um, needle exchange program. There was a lot of background work that needed to be done. Uh, one of the things that we did was we really worked to persuade the police that uh, needle exchange programs do not increase crime, in fact they reduce it. And we brought in um, police officers with experience in this from Australia so that they could talk to their peers and show them the data that shows that if you have needle exchange programs, you have two benefits. One is that you stop uh, the spread of HIV uh, and the other is that you do actually reduce crime. So, yeah. so where do you find the voice or that courage to take on big topics um, like this, right? It's not only a taboo, it's actually also going against a lot of the things that was happening at the time. I don't know, I just did it really. Um, I think when I, when I was asked to head the, the foundation and then the council, um, I really, uh, one I found that there was so much prejudice you know, there was so much prejudice in Malaysian society. I would go and visit corporate heads and all that uh, to try and raise funds and they would go, why should we fund these people? And some of them were saying, well, just let them die. And uh, there was one guy even uh, who suggested that, why don't we just shoot them all? I, yeah, I know your, your jaw dropped, but people actually said this and thought it was okay. And so I realized that there was so much ignorance uh, that I needed to educate them as well. So it wasn't just a matter of, can you please give me some money? I had to educate them why. And to educate them, I had to educate myself. So I had to read a lot. And also, I think my best teachers were actually the people affected by HIV. Um, the drug users, the sex workers, the transgendered people, the most vulnerable people um, to HIV, as well as their families. Uh, because you know, our statistics only record the person with HIV. They, they don't record the people around them who are as affected by the stigma and everything. So, I think once you do that, I mean, I, you, you really start to realize, like, who are you working for, you know? Um, and, and you realize that, you know, as a society, we, we're all part of it. There's no, um, there are no walls uh, around different groups of people, as much as people like to put them, but there aren't. And um, you can't actually help the whole of society by, by just, you know, putting aside some people. Um, so, you know, it, it, once you know these stories, once you, once you know the stories of the people on the ground, 
Um, and you know, why do, I mean, most people get HIV because they never heard of it. And we have the studies and all that to prove that. Um, you sort of realize that you have to speak out. Um, they can't, they find it very hard because of the stigma and, and everything. So you have to speak out. So you just do and you just find your voice. I, th I think everyone who works in activism, who, who you know, works in the, on the ground for whatever causes, you just do because otherwise what's the point? You know, you don't change anything. Yeah. Absolutely. And you touched on this briefly already. Um, my next question is around women's rights. Yeah. Um, and we all understand how important it is. I'm a huge uh, advocate for women's rights as well, um, especially when I was in Australia um, and now back in Malaysia as well. Um, why women's rights? As obvious a question as it is. Why? Because, <laughs> I mean, I'm a woman. Um, <laughs> I don't know why you were fighting for women's rights, but... Um, <laughs> In Australia, on top of that. Um, no, I mean, it's, it's really about human rights. Um, it's, um, you know, ev everyone, everyone is a human being. Everyone is entitled to the same rights. But you find people aren't, not everyone is able to enjoy the same rights, whether it's because of lack of education, whether it's because of poverty, whether it's because someone is stopping them from enjoying those rights. So for me, I think I, I, was, I naturally grew up with um, a, a natural attachment, I suppose, to women's rights uh, because, I, because of the family I grew up in. I mean, I saw a, a mother who was very much um, an empowered woman um, and um, so to me, uh, that the fact that people can't do what she does, to me, is very strange. And, if, and that if I couldn't do it, also very strange. Um, my, my parents always treated us equally, especially when it came to education. So, um, so seeing that you know, other women didn't get to enjoy this was, to me, very strange. Also, in the early days, I used to... Uh, I, I, and I still am, I'm a member of women's aid organization and women's aid works on domestic violence. Um, and um, to me it was astounding that um, women got beaten by their own husbands um, and really viciously as well. And uh, the whole campaign to make domestic violence a crime was really, really, I mean it took six years to get through parliament. There was so much objection to it by people who said it's just a family matter. It shouldn't be made a crime. Um, same thing is happening now with the caning thing. It's just a family matter. It shouldn't be made a crime. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, that... Uh, and people were saying, and this was the, the, the genesis of Sisters in Islam, actually. This is how it started when the domestic violence uh, uh, campaign was on, the domestic violence bill uh, campaign was on, that people said that, um, okay, you can have this law, but it cannot apply to Muslims because Muslim men are allowed to beat their wives. And there are all these women who thought, like, really? Is that true? If we are supposed to be, you know, uh, created by the same God, how come we, you know, we could be treated that way, we could be discriminated that way. And that's how they started to go back to the source, back to the text, talk to Islamic scholars and, and found that one day there's a diversity of opinion on that. Uh, there was a diversity of interpretations of that particular verse that seems to allow. And even if you read it as B, it was certainly not the first thing you're supposed to do uh, in conflict resolution and um, and so you know based on that that's how they campaign and finally after six years the Domestic Violence Act came into being got passed by Parliament and we became the first Muslim country in the world wow. to have a Domestic Violence Act Wow so yeah so you know this type of experience and although I was not directly involved with the DVA campaign um, a lot of my friends were so I knew uh, what was happening and and um, 
hey, it's like, why wouldn't you give women their rights? Unless you thought of them as lesser beings, as less than human. And the same thing for me applied to all the, the groups that I worked with in HIV. I mean, are you saying that they are less than human just because they take drugs or they have to be sex workers or they're born transgendered, whatever? If that's, you know, if you think they're lesser human beings, then I don't know. I mean, how, how do you, they bleed the same way, they breathe the same air, you know, that sort of thing. So I didn't get it. I didn't get why another human being should have less rights. So it became natural to, to fight for it. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's one of the um, very common characteristics when we look at social activists, that people who cannot face in social injustice. And the first question they always ask when they're faced with social injustice is, what can I do about it? There has to be something wrong with this. Uh, I just want to quick, uh, quickly remind everyone that remember to write your question down on the piece of paper that you received when you guys came in and put your hand up and one of the magic staff members will come and collect from you guys um, and then we can ask the, those questions as well. So staff, uh, magic staff, can you help to collect the questions please? So the next question is around social activism and unity. So I find that sometimes uh, well, I've been observing this whole thing in Malaysia, especially in the last uh, month and a half since I've been back. Um, I've only been back once. I've only been back a month and a half, yes. So, <laughs> great time, right? Um, so, I, it seems like whenever there's an issue, whether it's natural disaster or social issues, the issues generally either um, split people or they unite people. And I find that, I, more optimistically, find that generally it does unite people more. Do you find that social activism is a platform for unity? So whether it's campaigning for animals' rights, which we've seen also the past month and a half, um, when it comes to the banjir that's been happening across both East and West Malaysia, um, does social issues bring people together? Uh, it depends. <laughs> um, I, think, I think it depends on who you're talking about. Um, and what actually, what the events um, that you're talking about. Uh, there are events that bring people together and there are those that split people apart. And um, things like natural disasters tend to bring people together. Uh, like the flood was an amazing example of that. Um, partly because government was slow to respond and people just uh, felt they had to do something. Also, a lot of people uh, had family or friends in all the flood affected areas and they just felt they couldn't sit by and do nothing. So, they were doing amazing things, you know, it wasn't just a matter of donating money or collecting stuff, but some people actually just got into their cars and went to deliver things or to try and help out. So, they were actually much faster um, than in, in some government agencies. Um, there's an issue of coordination of all that, but, and I think that brought people together because nobody was, well, people didn't really differentiate uh, who they wanted to help, you know, and, and when you look at all the packing centers, you know, where people were packing stuff up, you, you found everybody there. And as long as there were no politicians there, it was great because, <laughs> because you know, people just came and helped. Um, Unfortunately, on the other end, the distribution end, um, if there were, uh, sad to say, uh, politicians who got involved, and then there was some differentiation of who could get uh, the goods. It's, it's very, it wasn't about just anybody who, you had to show your loyalty first. I mean, that's how ridiculous it was, you know. But on this end, on the normal, everyday human being, side. There, there wasn't, a, and I, I thought there was real unity. And we've seen that in other times, like for instance for MH370 uh, or MH17. I'm part of a group uh, called Malaysians for Malaysia, um, whose role in life basically all we want to do is to organize events that bring people together. And uh, in the wake of MH370, I think almost immediately, MH370 disappeared on Saturday, on Monday we started we put up the walls of hope. Uh, basically, we just called out 
the shopping centers around and say, will you put up a wall where people can come and write messages of support, uh, prayers, etc., for the passengers of MH370. And that's what happened. And people just did. People, I think, really needed a place where they could express that, where they could, you know, because people felt helpless, totally helpless. I mean, we still feel helpless. We don't know what happened to it, right? So um, those walls really serve as a, an outlet for grief, for people to ex uh, express their grief, but also their hope. And the great thing about it was that they didn't differentiate, you know. They didn't say, oh, I'm only praying for the Muslim passengers or just the Chinese ones or whatever. If you go to the walls, you see messages from all sorts of people um, in every language. And it was just really moving. And, and there was so much, you know, Mid Valley, the wall in Mid Valley had 40,000 messages. Just that one. And we had at least, well, we initiated, I think, about 15 walls around the country, and then everyone else took it up as well. So that, that was something that was really heartfelt and just came from the ground. And, and those, I think, are really, really good signs that Malaysians actually, you know, will come together. Because people say that we only come together when something bad happens. Um, but I think it's, it, it's still telling, I think it's, it still says a lot. So b compared this, right, to, to a, the previous point earlier about things like HIV and AIDS, um, do you think it's a lot about empathy? So with issues like this, you know, Bungie and 370, people can relate to, to it because they have been on a plane or they have, you know, been affected by floods before. Whereas with something like HIV, AIDS, taboo topic, it's something that they can't relate to because they, they think that they've never um, met someone with HIV AIDS right. or they have never even spoken to someone with HIV AIDS. Do you think empathy is what we, we really need to yeah. focus on? I, I think like with MH370 they sort of felt like that could have happened to me and the floods too, that could have happened to me and so there's, there's more empathy with it. With HIV there's this belief and it's, it's not a true belief actually that, um, that this happens to certain people and they would never be uh, affected by it or, or things like that. I mean, we now know it's not true, but it's still hard, I think, because, I mean, there are no HIV education programs right now, none. There are no more billboards. There are no more public education campaigns about this. So, you know, people think, one, it's gone away, or still it only happens to certain people and somehow they deserve it. Except when it comes to babies. Babies don't deserve it. But then, if you want to put HIV positive children in schools, all the parents say no. I, it's, you know, it, it's really this sort of um, conflicting you know, view of things. But yeah, you're right. It, people, when they empathize, um, then they're much better. But I think a lot of that can be um, encouraged through education, better education. I think that's one of the biggest message that I've taken so far, and we're only like a quarter of into it, is education. And especially education by, through the empathetic learning, right? One of the biggest things that you did was to actually go to the people who were affected and talk to them and listen to them. And I feel like, um, so through Magic SE, we have worked with quite a lot of social enterprises. And that's one of the issues that I realized with a lot of social entrepreneurs is they don't actually go to the ground to talk to the people they're trying to reach in the first place before they start building the idea up the top, and then they have this top-down approach. Would you think, do you, would you agree that, that education to build empathy is one thing that people need to focus on? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I was uh, a judge uh, a couple of years ago for a, a social enterprise competition by a semi-private organization. I won't name which one. And they don't have it anymore. I think after I was there and I had so many comments that they, they kind of stopped it. Because what I found was that all the teams, and they were university um, teams, um, were doing exactly that. Um, they had a product uh, that they wanted to sell, and then they looked for a problem to solve with it, which to me was completely the wrong way around. And, and uh, during the judging process, I kept asking them, what is the problem that you want to solve? 
and many of them simply could not articulate it. And, um, and so it didn't work, you know, I think they didn't get the idea. You have to start with the problem and for that you have to do research, you have to read a lot or you have to be out there um, to, to kind of get first hand knowledge on what the problem is and then work from there. You may not get the idea straight away, it may not necessarily be solved by some business idea necessarily, um, but that's, you have to start that way, otherwise you are, you are going to, it, it's not going to work because you, there's a disconnect between reality and, and what you want to do, yeah. I can see my colleague Amir nodding fiercely there. So Amir re reviews all the grant application and he always go, where is this guy's problem statement? <laughs> right, exactly, yeah. And I mean, a, a lot of fantasy stories, you know. Um, yeah. So we actually ran a workshop on problem, uh, how, to, how to break down problems and actually, you know, discover the problems that you're trying to solve before you even go about coming up with an idea for a solution. Right. <laughs> so we got a question uh, from the crowd. How much of your work are influenced um, from your family? Oh, a lot of it. A lot of it. Uh, because, you know, everything you do in life, I don't know, at least I, what I do, like, comes from some sort of values. Uh, and the values that you, are, you grow up with. Um, and I grew up with certain values that my family um, instilled in us. Uh, one is hard work, that nothing comes for free. Um, I remember my parents used to laugh because we used to love entering these competitions uh, in the newspaper where you had to write a slogan or something, you know, kind of, and, and you win it. At that time, I remember, and this, this, this will age me, um, <laughs> when uh, Malaysia Airlines was first set up. That's how far back, I'm sure none of you were around. Well, maybe some of you. Some of you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, and then when they, when they split up with uh, Singapore and became Malaysia, Malaysian Airlines. Malaysian Airlines is the must. And, um, and then their first flight to London. I mean, like, wow, you know, we can go to London. And they had all these competitions and all very eager to you know, take part in these competitions and, you know, have to write slogans and want to win a prize to London. And my parents, you know, especially my dad, used to laugh and said, you know, the chances of you uh, winning that is so small. And, um, and really, you know, you think you can get something for free, you know, just writing a slogan, it's hardly work, hard work. And, um, and basically, they instilled uh, in us that if you want anything, you have to work for it. Um, nothing comes for free. So that's one of those things that we really, really grew up with. Um, and, and we grew up also seeing them always volunteering. Um, my mom volunteered at the Family Planning Association. My dad was at the uh, NTTB, uh, NTTB Closes Association, Rotary Club and all that. So we were used to seeing them volunteer. So it became a natural thing to do eventually. Uh, you know, it took some time, but yeah, eventually. It's, it, I guess it's part of our DNA. Mm. So eventually it comes out in some way or other, yeah. You just answered the second question as well, which is what lessons your father taught you about life? Yeah, well, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly it, yeah. So there's another question from Hani. Hani, um, my husband and I advocate sex education to our children. Our mantra is uh, 7E is always around the corner. 7E, is that right? What 7 Oh, 7-11. Oh, 7 oh, right, right, right. Ah. What do you think about the state of sex education in our current education system? It's a tiny question, you know. <laughs> Funny, I was having a discussion yesterday with exactly about this, with actually someone who wants to start up a social enterprise to teach, to actually try and prevent, um, you know, abuse, try to prevent unwanted babies and all that, which... You should and, and well, the, well I, I had a lot of um, tweaking of it. Um, and um, well, what, if I send them to you, what will you say? <laughs> you, you finish first. You finish first. <laughs> no, because I, you know, they, you see, 
this has been a question that's been going on for years, you know, 40 years or whatever, you know, it's still talking about sex education in schools. It's not happening. It's just not happening. No matter what we call it, call it family life education, family planning has got something called the reproductive health uh, for adolescents program, very nice and all that, but it's not happening. Uh, many, many reasons, and I, I could be here all day talking about it. But basically, the will to do it is not there, simply, uh, you know. And one person needs to protest, and, and that's it. That will be the end of it. And, and yet, we complain about abandoned babies, we complain about all sorts of things, um, which obviously, um, you know, kids without education do. And one of the dangerous things is, of course, HIV. I mean, you know, when I was working there, we say we can't have HIV education without sex education. I, how? How do you talk about And I tell you, the, the level of ignorance about their own bodies and how it functions is unbelievable. Uh, and one story is we had this young boy who, for some reason, I don't know how, I don't know what type of body he had, but <laughs> he thought that um, sperm came out of his knees. <laughs> and so as long as you keep your knees out of the way, you're fine. I was like, oh, you know, uh, it, it's unbelievable. It, it, there, and there were so many stories like that. Um, so, you know, it, it was really very, very important. But more than that, you see, it's not just a matter of giving education. Um, it's all the things around it. How do you actualize the knowledge that you have? Um, you can be told that condoms prevent HIV, but you can't go and buy it. So how, you know, um, how, do, how do you do that? Um, and it's, it's really, again, there is a disconnect between uh, policymakers and reality. Really, there is a disconnect. I mean, I used, to, I used to have to work with Ministry of Health, and they always used to tell me, you know, be careful what you say, you can't talk about sex, you know, da, 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 da. And I remember going to schools to give talks on HIV. And I'd have a whole assembly hall full of kids, mostly uh, secondary school, uh, form one to form five, like that. And, I, and I'll talk about, you know, I'll be as, n you know, as safe as possible and talk <laughs> as, you know, as near as possible, um, as delicately as possible. Didn't show any funny pictures, nothing. <laughs> And the minute it's question time, one little fella from the back will come to the front and say, what's so great about condoms? <laughs> and all the teachers are like, oh my oh. God. <laughs> um, but then they're very happy because I'm the one doing the answering and they don't have to do it. And I will answer. And I will answer factually. And, and, you know, it's, it's really amazing. We, we did a whole program where we were educating religious leaders on HIV. Religious leaders really at the grassroots level, the local Ustad, the local Kadi, sometimes the Ketua Kampung, who is also the local Kadi and all that. And, of course, the, the issue of condoms comes out. And they were so about it. So finally, in one session, we had, we finally asked them, have you ever seen a condom? And they all were like, no. So my staff who were conducting the workshop actually went out to the 7-Eleven, <laughs> <laughs> bought 27 packets, came, gave every single one of them, and told them, open it. Open it, look at it. And at the end of it, they said, you mean we are afraid of this little piece of rubber? Ah? <laughs> and that's what it is. You know, they, they were so scared of this thing. They thought it was like some, don't know what, you know. But that's because they just had no experience of it. And we found that when we educated all these local, local level religious leaders, they became very supportive. Because why? At their level, at the kampong level, 
they were already seeing HIV and they didn't know what to do. I think one of the, I, I, this, I don't know if it's about you guys, but this whole night I've been getting goosebumps or I've been having jaw drops moment, going like, really? Really? People ask Yeah, there's a of lot stuff. of really, I can, <laughs> mm, yeah. But there is a second lesson there that I just picked up, which is when you try to solve a social problem, just don't just hone in just one that, prob um, that specific problem, but think holistically around that problem as well. Because to pull an analogy, you, you can't make a te tare without learning how to make a te in the first place, right? Something like that. I like, <laughs> like this, these people I was talking to yesterday who wanted to go in and do this reproductive health education and all that. I said, look, and, and they wanted to go to schools, which meant they had to talk to the Ministry of Education and uh, all that sort of thing. And I said, well, tell you what, you go into the Ministry of Education and you talk about, you know, wanting to go to schools to talk about sex education or whatever, they're going to come back and tell you no. Uh, or, hmm, ha, hmm, ha, yeah, maybe, and then it's five years later and nothing has happened. Um, so sometimes you need a kind of sideways approach. Do something else that uh, gets you in, I mean, you have to be sneaky, I'm sorry, but you know, in this country, I'm afraid you have to. With 3R, for instance, with our host, we went to all the university campuses last year. Uh, not all, I mean, we did. 14 of them, one in each state, um, to ostensibly give uh, a workshop on leadership to the female students. But what it was really about was raising their awareness about discrimination uh, and gender inequality and all that. And once they realized, then they started to tell us stories about what they were experiencing in their lives in the university, you know, and, and and it was really like, you know, oh my God moments for them because, you know, they were frustrated with the situation and angry about it, but they didn't know what it was called and whether that was the way things are supposed to be. And we're trying to tell them, no, you can change that. But you have to speak up, you have to stand up for it. I think the third lesson there, which is sometimes to get from where you are to where you want to get to, is not as straightforward as just here to there, no. sometimes you need to talk to people sideways yeah, something like that. and then get to where you need to get to. That's the third lesson, right? So we have another question from the crowd. Again, if you have any questions that you thought of as we're talking, write them down and put up your hand and the staff will come collect it from you. This is from Ng Jong Kian. As part of the National Unity Consulta uh, Consultative Council, which is instrumental in drafting the National Harmony Act, what are the future steps the Council is taking to push for the implementation of the Act following the Prime Minister's announcement that the Sedition Act uh, will not be repealed? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, how do I answer this delicately? Delicately. Um, Which brings up another question, but I'll ask you later. Okay. Well, we were tasked to uh, come up with some sort of blueprint uh, on um, unity and harmony uh, for, for this country. So one of the things we came up with, and, and we have actually, I mean, it's going to be a huge report because the members of the uh, NUCC, we have 30 of us, very dedicated, and we have all these subcommittees looking at all the different um, aspects of life in Malaysia that causes this unity, and that includes economic inequalities, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, and each one, well, most of them have come up with really a lot of work, a lot of research, and really some stupendous reports. And we're going to go to a final round uh, coming up soon, uh, in a couple of weeks. But, um, and we, we talked to a lot of people. We, we did a whole series of town hall meetings around the country. Plus, we had all sorts of groups come and talk to us uh, and, and talk frankly to us about all the the issues that they faced, which they felt contributed to disunity, uh, and how, what were the ideas for unity. I was part of the um, law and policy uh, subcommittee, and, uh, which is chaired by uh, YB Datuk Mujahid Rawa. Um, and um, we came up with this um, bill, uh, three bills. It's collectively known as the National Harmony Bills. 
Um, and at that time, because the Prime Minister had said they were going to repeal the Sedition Act, we thought that it would be good to come up with a replacement. And the replacement actually came, our idea for a replacement actually came in the form of three bills. One is the anti-hate uh, crime bill, if I remember correctly. Um, and that basically um, criminalizes hate uh, speech uh, without uh, curtailing freedom of speech. And basically the difference is that if some speech is proven to lead to violence, then, then there, there is cause for some action, some punitive action to be taken. But if you're just talking and there is uh, no um, intention of violence, then it's all right. That's part of uh, freedom of speech. So all opinions are, are okay. Um, and we did take into cognizance the Constitution and certain things were kind of, you know, according to the Constitution of limits and that sort of thing. But it, the difference between that and the Sedition Act is that the Sedition Act, you don't have to prove intention. You have to, but with the bills that we were proposing, you have to prove intention. So in fact, someone like Ibrahim Ali should support us because, um, you know, the, the prosecutor, if anyone wanted to charge him under the new bill, they would have to prove that he intended violence when he said wanted to burn the Bible. Under the Sedition Act, there's no such thing. Uh, sedition Act, you say only you can already. You, you don't have to, uh, you know, the intention doesn't matter under the Sedition Act, right? So that was one. The second one was the anti-discrimination bill, which is a, a civil uh, law that we were proposing. And that is for things like job discrimination. We, we follow Article 8 in the, uh, in the Federal Constitution, which prohibits uh, discrimination based on many things, race, religion, um, creed, gender, etc., etc. And so it's things like housing discrimination or job discrimination. The example we like to give is that, for example, in the retail industry, there is a great reluctance uh, to employ women who wear the tudong. So under that new bill, uh, it would, that would be considered uh, discriminatory. And um, so anyone can complain based on, under that law. And the remedy is that it goes to mediation, which was the third bill, which was setting up a mediation agency. So you don't have to go through like courts so much, you go through... So it was very well thought out. Unfortunately, it's been really misrepresented um, in the media. And, um, and uh, yeah, so yeah, the AG came and scolded us. And uh, yeah, so I don't know what's quite happening. Uh, apparently, uh, we, we were kind of... Um, scolded for having the temerity to draft a bill, you know, a law bill, because only AG's chambers are supposed to do that. Um, actually, under the Domestic Violence Act, the Domestic Violence Bill was drafted by NGOs. Um, so there is a precedent <laughs> for it. Um, but yeah, you know, some people have short memories. So. Um, anyway. So yeah, so we don't quite know where that's happening, but the blueprint is carrying on and we will just present it to the government. And then it's up to them lah, what they want to do. Which brings me to the next question. It's, a, it's a, I think a question that a lot of people would face and very much I personally find I, me myself asking this question sometimes. When you, especially when you, you're working on an issue that's sensitive or you're working with government, um, you are, like you said earlier, um, when you work with Ministry of Health, there's things that you know they tell you to say or not to say, or they go. Uh, how do we go about you know being careful about? Can we say that or not? Uh? Um, how do you choose what to say and what not to say? Or well, how do you make sure it's sensitive and careful, right? My my policy is that there is nothing, there is no subject that is too sensitive to be talked about, none. But there are sensitive ways of approaching it. Right? 
Like when I talk about sex education, when I talk about HIV, I'm not up there on stage showing obscene pictures or making it because it, it's not right. I'm there to educate, not to titillate, right? So it, it's, you know, it's how, I mean, if you sit down and think of how you're going to approach the subject, you can talk about it. The trouble is nowadays, whatever you say, because the other person actually has no answer to it, um, they, they say, oh, it's too sensitive, you can't talk about it. But it's ridiculous, you know. Um, you, everything can be talked about. And I, I personally don't buy this thing about you have to be an expert before you can talk about it. Because very often, the people who are impacted by these things are also experts. Experts in how the damn law affects them, <laughs> you know. Um, so, I, you know, you want to know, like for instance, our drug laws, the real experts on how the drug laws affect people are drug users, mm -hmm. right? But when are you ever going to ask them to come to the table at a policy making uh, meeting uh, ever to give their input? So you're always, always actually leaving out the experts from, from uh, the discussion, right? So, you know, it's, I think everyone has a right to, to say their piece uh, about whatever because, um, you know, there are so many laws that, that affect all of us, so yeah. Which is true, actually, when I was um, emailing uh, Marina, I ask you, you know, is there any topic that I shouldn't be talking about? And you're like, nope, we can discuss anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you Just don't ask me how much I weigh or something. <laughs> <laughs> if you weren't a social activist, what would you, have, what would you be? Oh, I don't know. I, I'd just be lazy and do nothing. <laughs> um, I don't know, actually. I, I, cannot, I cannot imagine being doing anything else. Um, having said that, when I started in 93, when I was first asked to uh, join the foundation, I could never have imagined then what I'd be doing now uh, or what I would be now. I'm, I think I'm a different person, uh, a, a more developed person, I think, now um, than I was then. I mean, I think 93, I was pretty naive. I didn't know what I was getting into. And uh, I just didn't foresee anything, you know, what, 20 years down the line, uh, what I would be doing or, or, or anything. So I, I think I just kind of leave it. I mean, t if you ask me what would I be doing in 20 years' time, I don't know. I really don't know. I, I take things as they come and um, roll with it or if there's an opportunity. And, and uh, yeah, I think that's... That's the way life goes, yeah. That's a great attitude to have. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, lessons for us as well, right? Um, lessons for us. So the next thing is around, um, have you, has, there any, has there been a time when you go, ah, crap, I should have said that? Um, yeah. <laughs> how, how, do you, how do you then, you know, go about that? Because I'm only asking because it's relevant to me. Um, and then you go, oh crap, I shouldn't have said that. And you're like, oh, how, what do I do now? And uh, yeah, um, I, I worry about it for like two seconds and then I move on. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I mean, usually it's like, uh, I shouldn't have said it quite that way. I should have said it a different way. But you know, what to do? It's already out on the internet and all around the world now. What can I do? So yeah, the next time I get a chance, I'll say it properly, whatever, you know. We've got another question from Sean. More and more women are making it on their own. The issues in Malaysia are human rights. The way we treat our mates, foreign workers, and so on is appalling. Do you think that women's rights is less of a relevance compared to human rights? Well, number one, I'm glad someone recognizes that there is a problem with the way we treat our migrant workers, especially our domestic workers in this country. Yeah, you'd be surprised how many people think that that's the way people should be treated. Um, what is women's right less than human rights? Less relevance than human rights in Malaysia. Women's rights are human rights. Women are human. <laughs> yeah. 
So. I was gonna answer on behalf of you, but then uh, I was like, I'm gonna let you speak for that one. No, no, it's completely. You know something. Um, human rights are universal. They are. They are for everyone. And um, it's. It's. I don't think that you can fully realize your own human rights, even if someone else's is is um, violated or or is lessened. I think there's a famous saying that is attributed to Martin Luther King that saying that a just, an injustice anywhere is an injustice everywhere. And, and that's really true, you know. I can't sit still if I think that there is someone else who is not enjoying um, their full human rights um, and I could do something about it. Even if it's just to raise awareness about it. Um, I, I really don't buy this thing like solve our problems here first and then worry about other people because you know if you believe in the universality of human rights then you have to at least be concerned you know about other people so I mean I give talks on this to to school kids and to young students you know about the universality of human rights like for example if you are very, very concerned about the Palestinians, and that's an issue of land, people whose land is being taken away from them, you also have to be concerned about the Orang Asli and the Orang Asal in this country whose land is also being taken away from them. You, you cannot say, that's more important, this is not important. It, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Same thing like... If you feel discriminated against as a minority in this country, then you also have to worry about minorities that are being discriminated against in other countries. For example, the Rohingyas in Myanmar or you know, the Tamils and the Muslims in Sri Lanka or whatever. Because otherwise you, you, you are differentiating yourself. They, they are somehow less equal, less worthy or, or something. You know? so, this universality is something that you really, really have to grasp properly. Otherwise, I think you have no credibility. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I think that's one thing that a lot of people can't differentiate. People always go, you know, which problem is more important? And I was just like, there, you can't rank problems. Of no, you can't. You can't. Also, you cannot do something for everybody all exactly. the time. But to say that that's less... I mean, there's, you know, there's a genocide probably happening on our doorstep just a couple of hours away, you know, and it's going to affect us because they're all going to become refugees and all come over here, right? And then, uh, so we, we can't just turn a blind eye and then complain about the result of it, right? It's the same, like not wanting to do sex education, but then complain about abandoned babies. You know, connect the dots. You know, one leads to the other. Yeah. So I was speaking at an event uh, last week, and a, an animal activist, uh, animal rights activist, came up to me and you know was telling me, you know, I'm getting so tired, you know, trying to do this at the same time, trying to earn money, and then do this in my free time, and I and I was standing there going, I, I, I understand, and you know, like I, I was a, a huge campaigner, uh, anti-suicide campaigner back in Australia. I know what it's like being a social activist. It's hard work, and you put so much energy. In. Sometimes you get no return. Sometimes you do get a little bit of movement, right? How do you stay motivated? How do I stay motivated? Uh, with great difficulty. Um, <laughs> no, I think, I think one of the joys of working um, in an NGO, particularly I think an NGO of women, is the, the culture we have in an NGO is, is a very different one. It's a very supportive, affirming, when and and we support each other all the time and and, and it's so it, you know when things get really bad we always have each other and um, and that helps a great deal because you feel like okay I'm not in this alone it's not personal um, it's and it's not just about us it's about uh, you know a larger larger group of people like you know. I can't get depressed about uh, any situation, you know, when things go bad because someone always has it worse than me, you know. I'm a very privileged person um, and, you know, 
I get to to you know sit in a comfortable office and all that. But there are people who who don't have anything, who get beaten up, or who have a virus in their bodies which they can't get rid of. I mean, my problems are small compared to these people. So, you know, when you put it in perspective like that, then you say, yeah, I can't stop. You know, I mean, okay, I'll. I'll go and cry in a corner for, for an hour or so, and then I get back into it. That's it. Which brings me to the next question. It's roughly similar, along similar lines. Personally, one of the things that I've found um, since coming back is that the, the noise out there sometimes can be overwhelming, right? <laughs> um, whether it's negative noises or, or criticism or pessimism, it can be overwhelming. How, how do you, you know, cut through some of this negative... Um, noises around you? I don't open my Facebook and I don't, oh, don't open my Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone needs a Facebook holiday or a Twitter holiday because really it can be so toxic. It's unbelievable. I don't know what people get out of it. You know, I feel like some, you, you get all these haters and if you go and look at my Facebook page and look at some of the comments, and I feel like asking them, you know, are you happy? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, do you have some nice things in your life? Uh, you know, that, what do you get out of saying these horrible things? Um, yeah, you know, that's, that's, there is a lot of noise. And, and unfortunately, social media just amplifies the noise. And, um, well, I, I think also, and I, I keep saying this, that, on your own Facebook page, your own Twitter account, I think you have a responsibility to set the tone for your own page or your own mm. Twitter account. I mean, I see people who constantly chujo, you know, when they're on their account. And, and it gets people worked up and then, you know, it goes crazy. But for me, I try and keep, well, first I assume that my followers are intelligent people for the most part. Um, uh -huh. And I try and keep a tone to the conversation that is civil. Yeah. So, and I think people then will take the lead from that. Um, I used to find, for instance, um, when I was blogging, I don't blog anymore, I got lazy. But <laughs> when I was blogging, uh, excuse me, um, I could put my column up there. Mm. And then you get all these sort of comments and things like that. And it was quite reasonable, you know, a reasonable conversation going on. And then someone else will take my column and put it on their blog. And because their blog has a certain tone, the, com the comments are completely different. Like completely off the wall, you know. <laughs> so it, it's really, then I've realized, it's really, really up to you how you set the tone. I mean, mm. your Facebook page is your house, you know, and, and you can decorate it the way you want. And, mm. and occasionally someone comes in and really messes in your house, I think you have a right to kick them out. Um, I very rarely, but yeah, <laughs> sometimes I do, I block. Oh, uh, now I know. <laughs> Not too many, actually, <laughs> relative to people who come the out. noise out there. Yeah. And I always call magic the house of magic because I do, I, I'm a passionate believer in culture, setting the tone of the culture, building a place full of love, full of, you know, all the things that we want to see happen in the world. So that when people come in here, they feel safe to actually experiment, to fail, to break, to make, and to create the things that they want to create. Um, and that's why I call this the house of magic. So culture plays a very important part in, in the way we communicate and the way we position and the way we, we speak to other people. It's yeah. And culture is not static, you know. Yeah. I mean, you can change things. You can change the way people work. Uh, you can change the way people talk to each other. I mean, you just have to set some rules. And, and again, you know, um, us NGOs, every time we have a workshop or a retreat or something, we start off mm. by setting the ground rules, you know, and saying this is a safe space. And, and everyone contributes to what type of rules they want, like, no side discussions, no, you know, no yelling or no whatever, you know. So, and, and that sort of makes things easy, mm -hmm. you know. And so, yeah, and you can change it up every time if it doesn't work. 
which brings me to another question and um, another one that's slightly uh, furry and hairy. Um, furry and hairy. As in not, I like furry not and literally. Hairy. Um, do you think that women can do the same thing as men? Um, and how can women keep their rights? <laughs> women rights. Why don't you ask the other <laughs> way around? Can men do the same thing as women? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, to ask, right? They can't have babies. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> They're not as great at nurturing, that's for sure. I, I, you know, I, I, you know, gender. When we talk about gender, there is this misconception that gender is only about women. Mm. It's not true. It's about both. Gender is about how society decides how a sex should be, you know, that women should be this way or men should be this way. And this can change over time across cultures, all sorts of things, you know. Um, so gender is, is, a, is a, you know, and, and things like that about what women can do, men can do, that's not necessarily apart from having babies it's not something that is biological mm -hmm. right it's about society's expectations and we've seen i mean gosh i can't believe we're still having this conversation we've seen <laughs> over the centuries how things have changed for both men and women mm. um you know the top chefs are men Whereas once upon a time, you know, cooking and all that kitchen stuff is all only about women, mm. right? Um, women have gone up into space, done everything, now lead companies, lead countries, for God's sake, you know. All these things, we, it's changed over time. So, they, it's not fixed, you know, gender uh, is not fixed at all. So, you know, this question of whether can women do things that men can do, yeah, if they want to, they put their minds to it, why not? Mm. Um, the limitations would most often be biological or really physical. Mm. Um, and whatever um, the market needs, so to speak. I mean, there, there are plenty of studies now that uh, women are, are getting ahead of men in many areas because they have the soft skills. Mm. Uh, that's much needed, you know, in, in um, they're much more meticulous, they communicate better, they, they, you know, and all these sort of things. So, but I, I think men could learn that too, if they can get over the, the, the gender stereotype that they give to themselves. I mean, there's a fantastic uh, TED Talk, a fantastic book uh, by, oh gosh, what's the name? I did not tip my tongue, but the article was called The End of Men. Yes. And uh, the minute people, men read the headline, then they don't want to read anymore. Mm. Which is too bad, because really what she's calling for is that because, and, and, and it's full of studies and all that about women in the universities, more women in universities all around the world, and how it's changing. Uh, the way society perceives women. Um, in some cases, women are seen more valuable because mm. of that. Um, but men are not adapting uh, to it. Um, the qualities that a lot of employers need come more naturally to women, uh, but men can do it too if they were to adapt. Um, in, excuse me. In places where the economy is really suffering and mm. there is a real need to, to change uh, jobs and all that. Um, it's, you know, women are, are doing it much better than men. Um, for instance, in, in some places, uh, some state governments or whatever, say in the states, they are um, uh, funding night classes for retraining, gaining new skills mm. and all that. And it's filled with women. The men just don't want to do it for some reason. So that's a problem. Also, the expectations, um, are, and we're seeing it here too in our universities. Uh, there was a fantastic quote where this, this student, woman student, who's, who is um, doing a PhD, and, um, and she was complaining about the guys, that the guys were, were happy if they got a C. 
But the girls, you know, were working always towards an A. So they're going to come out with like super duper qualifications and the guys are not. And um, like, who are they supposed to marry, you know? And I think we have this problem. We have this problem here too, you know, because we're 60% girls in universities coming out like, who are they supposed to marry? The 40% of the guys? I, you know, and what's happening is, unfortunately, what's happening is, is that a lot of, because there's a lot of social pressure on women to get married, um, usually from parents and all that, they are marrying lesser men. You know, because they're really, do, they're, you know, less qualified men. What does this lead to? And I wish someone would really make the studies of this. What does it lead to? It leads to a lot of discord and conflict uh, in those marriages and in the very bad cases, it leads to violence. I mean, we've heard stories because we run a hotline um, for women, uh, I mean, the sisters we run. We have stories, I mean, a woman who is qualified as a doctor forced to marry a telephone operator or something like that. You know, I mean, this huge disparity, of course it's going to cause conflict. So this is a big issue where, where we have to, which we have to address. And I don't think we should address it by lowering the entry requirements for boys into universities. Because <laughs> the girls get really angry about that. You know, they say, we work so hard, you know, uh, and then these guys come in just like that. Um, but it, it is an issue that needs to be addressed in some way. Plus, we need to change the idea of, I, I keep talking about this also, change the idea of how men see themselves as men. Like, you know, because that pressure to go out there and earn and all that is also very, very oppressive. And it's, it's one of the reasons why, you know, when I was in Australia, I, this is about Marina's wisdom, not mine. So but I want to share a story as well. One of the things that we did a lot was looking at um, the, the statistics of suicide around the world. And we know that um, suicide is becoming one of the leading cause of death uh, in many countries. Depression is now becoming the um, number one cause of disability all around the world and costing us more money than it should be. Um, and if you look at the statistics of depression, most of them are men. In Australia, almost 80% of them are men. And when you look at the causes of it, a lot of it comes down to the social pressure and the cultural pressure of masculinity. As a man, it's easier to suicide than to tell someone that I'm not okay, I'm struggling, I need help, because men are supposed to be in control and, like you said, provide for the family. So if you fail in any of that, you're a failure. Yeah, yeah exactly. And then in times of economic distress, in, you know, when countries go through uh, an economic depression, um, I think you will see an uptick also in depression cases as, and also uh, suicides as well because of that. Because, you know, no jobs, no nothing, you're not earning enough, prices are going up. The pressure is enormous, mm. enormous. We, there's an interesting um, sideline, a uh, side study which I think people should do. Um, We've done a huge uh, study on the impact of polygamy on families, which uh, we hope the book will come out sometime this year. It's, it's much delayed because our lead researcher has been ill. But we uh, interviewed uh, over a thousand people, uh, husbands, first wife, second wife, children, first wife, children, second wife. And the basic finding is that nobody is happy, um, including the men. <laughs> Why? Because it's so stressful. <laughs> it's so stressful having to manage more than one family. Oh. They are having, some of them are having to find extra jobs. They are, or they're working super overtime to, you know, pay for these two families. Mm. And I bet you, because I, I spoke to a doctor and uh, he had some interesting uh, insights on the patients that he saw because, well, occasionally he'd find uh, male patients who'd be visited by more than one woman um, because he had more than one wife. 
And he was in there because it, it was really affecting him, you know, his blood pressure and all that, having to manage. <laughs> and the funny thing was that he didn't want to go home. He didn't want to be discharged. <laughs> Why? Because if he's discharged, he has to go to one home, right? Um, which means that he can't go to the other home as well when he's not well. So this big problem, you know, so he'd rather stay in the hospital, a uh, neutral territory, and they can come and visit, rather than be in one house and then have the other one complain and all that. I mean, it's this type of things which really create a lot of health issues which you don't necessarily see unless you, you really go and study. That, that is another jaw-dropping jaw -dropping moment for me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, it's because it's interesting because the other thing, one of the TED Talks I was watching as well was talking about how we bring up... Hannah Rosin, that was the name of the woman who, who did that. Hannah, Hannah Rosin, Rosin. Uh, The End of Men. Yeah. Yeah. Very good talk, very good book. Go and read it. There was a, another TED Talk that I watched was how we bring up men, um, our son and daughter as well. When our son and daughter comes to us crying when they're young, with daughter we go, oh, Sayang, what happened? Like, tell me what happened. Whereas with boys, we usually go, you go into your room, stop crying, and you come out and tell me what's wrong. And we oppress them from, from expressing vulnerability. And so men then became struggles to express vulnerability, and instead their emotion becomes either uh, very mild emotions or they express it through anger and rage and, and so on and so forth. Back to your... Um, initial point around re reports of domestic violence due to um, all of that. Yeah. I've got another really good question from the crowd. Uh, Rachel, Rachel, healthcare in Malaysia is mainly under government responsibility, the Minister of Health, which is operating in a two-tier healthcare system, consists of government-run and private healthcare systems. In your opinion, what's the future of healthcare outlook of Malaysia and how it should shape in the future? Small, Small question. question. Let's, Let's look, look into 10 years, years from now. What should the healthcare system... Gosh, am I supposed to be the expert on everything? <laughs> um, well... You are the wise guest I, I, today. I'm not necessarily <laughs> wise in everything. Um, I think, you know, one thing, healthcare expenses are going to grow, go up. And this is going to affect a lot of people. And I think, as government, I think they should be concerned about it, you know, because... I think, I, and I'm, I'm hoping I don't get the stats wrong, but a lot, we have a lot more doctors in the private sector which caters to a smaller section of the public than in the public sector. So which there's a real you know, imbalance, and so that's why you get long queues and things in the public hospitals. You know? So this is going to be a big issue because health, Obviously, everyone you know is going to need some sort of healthcare at some point in their lives, um, and once it gets less affordable, then people are just going to opt to not be treated or be sick, and, and there are many implications. I mean, infectious diseases just being one, but if you have an unhealthy population, an unhealthy workforce, how can you develop this country? You need people who are well and healthy to work, right? Um, the other thing that I think they've been talking a lot about and but not doing enough is really about health promotion, you know? I was talking to someone today about, like, why don't we educate people better about food? You know, about how to eat properly and, and all that, because a lot of lifestyle diseases come from food. We have all this thing about, oh, sugar, you know, make it expensive so that people... but People don't understand why not sugar, you know? Why should you eat less sugar or eat less bread or less rice or less fast food? You know, in, in many countries, people are getting more aware and conscious about, um, about uh, healthy eating, healthy living and all that, but it's not happening here. I mean, it's stop and start, but it's, it's really not enough. And, if you could do that, health promotion, then you have lesser people in need of, you know, health care and all that. They're taking care of themselves. So that helps also. But yeah, I think, you know, I mean, I go to a hospital and, and I, I look at what we get charged and it's like, really? 
you know, it, it's really incredible, you know, and insurance would be a problem. The other problem coming up is the TPPA, you know, which, um, which uh, my colleagues in the Malaysian AIDS Council are leading the, 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 all the uh, movement against it because of what it means to the price of drugs. Mm. Um, we fought so hard to bring the price of uh, HIV drugs down to make it accessible to, to everyone who needs it, um, with the TPPA, we won't be able to do that. So that's really going to cost a lot of lives, yeah? And uh, it's, it's a big concern. Uh, I think it's a big problem. I think it's one of the um, participants earlier was talking to me about something else. But then one of the things that the participant was saying was, um, or attendees, not participants, um, or participants, same thing, right? Um, was saying that a lot of conversations are currently talking about treatment instead of prevention. Yeah. And so treatment is where all the, the big cost is. Prevention is where we know we can save a lot of money. And in fact, one of the things, a couple of us in the company at Magic are doing a detox at the moment. And I, people, some people are making fun of it, especially me, because I'm so tiny already. Everyone's like, why would you want to do detox? And I, it comes down to the education you know about... detox doesn't work, right? Uh, <laughs> it doesn't work, but... <laughs> There's an article. That my my justification. I understand. That I'm a medical scientist, and but my justification for the detox is about the mindfulness of eating. So I find that when I came back to Malaysia, because I haven't been, I've I've been away for 12 years, and coming back, I get so excited about all the food. I literally eat anything that was put in front of me. Um, roti canai in the morning, nasi lemak, nasi kerabu, nasi campur, nasi serai. Like these guys keep bringing me to great, amazing food places as well. Um, especially Ame. Um, so I find that I just put everything in my mouth, and I, I'm, which I'm not supposed to, right? And we know that obesity is a huge problem in Malaysia. So it's about that mind. And what I realized that in the last eight days, I've become more mindful about the food I eat. I look, I look at the ingredients. I think about, you know, what's the implication of it in my body and stuff like that. But you're educated about it. You see, the average person mm. is not. I mean, you look at a lot of, of. People, I mean, they can have nasi lemak every day, you know. I mean, it's incredible. I, I have it like once a year because if I have it, I, I put on 10 pounds straight away. You know, <laughs> like. um, so, you know, it's, it, you know it's, it's really hard. I mean, it's really hard in Malaysia because the food is so good. I know. Um, so, what to do? But yeah, there are ways, you know, of making it healthier or, you know, n not. Um, indulging in it and also it's about price right i think actually far more dangerous is is uh, really the all the fast food the fast food chains you know you know you know which ones they are <laughs> um because you know that whole chart we're the fattest country in southeast asia right and if you look if you overlay that statistic with the number of fast food outlets it probably matches <laughs> Right, because the thinnest one is like Laos or Cambodia. You know. <laughs> we're almost coming towards the end, so I've got a couple more questions. I'll ask you a one big question one first, and then we'll go through the nicer. The, yeah. Um, so one is around, recently I, have, uh, I read a research, this came from Yonglin. Uh, I read a research, it found that women discriminate themselves, um, meaning women felt that they are inferior than men. What do you think about this? <laughs> There's a lot of that. Um, it's, it's a form of brainwashing, I guess. It's, a, it's socialization, you know. Like I said, when we did that 3 out of 12 university campuses and, and talked to the students, I mean, they didn't at first understand what we were talking about when we talked about, you know, discrimination that they might be facing. And then once they, they understood, they started to look around and they started to realize how they were experiencing it. Mm. Like for instance, you know, 60% of our university students are female, but look at the leadership of the student councils. I, it's mostly guys. And some of the girls told stories about how when the student council elections came up, they were quite pointedly told not to stand. And, and then the ones who still stood and won uh, were not allowed to be presidents of the councils. I mean, you know, all these type of things. 
or they would work on group projects, but the one who gets to present is the guy. You know, the, the girls, you know, do all the work, the guy gets to present, and the guy is the one that is always talking to the lecturer, so the lecturer thinks that he's the one who is really, you know, the go-getter in the group. So once they started to see all these things, then they realized, uh, you know, they start to notice all these things happening around them. I think a lot of women don't um, realize that. They accept uh, that culture and things like that. And un unfortunately also many of them believe that that's religion as well, that we're supposed to take a subservient place. Um, the only way to elevate that, I think, is education again. And, um, and this type of, you know, in the 60s, it was called consciousness raising. I think we need to do a lot of that with our women here. It's not to make them unhappy, uh, but to make them aware and then also uh, give them the means, the tools, the, you know, to be empowered to do something about it. Yeah, and, and um, yeah, and, and that's the way. And we need yeah. more women in positions of power. We, we do, do indeed, uh, but you know there are a lot of invisible barriers to that. I'm I'm a, I'm a big uh, proponent of quotas for women, which is very controversial. People, a lot of women particularly, <laughs> don't like it. They say we don't, you know, we got here by ourselves. We didn't. Uh, you know, it's not because we are female, it's because we are good at our jobs. Um, well, you know, that's not the issue. The issue is how many more women you can bring along with you. Um, and that's, that's what's not happening. Yeah. Now the, the easier questions now. Oh, the right. yeah. yeah. So another one from the crowd, uh, from Jim. How do you define success? You can make it for yourself, and we, or we can talk about it more. It's not like essay questions. <laughs> you know, today I was at my daughter's school talking with the teachers, and it sounds like all the sort of questions she has to answer for her exams. Um, how do you find success? Or we can talk Gee about it in the context of social activism as well, right? Oh, okay. In the context of social, at least in the area I work with, when we manage to change a law or policy, that makes life better for people, um, or, or, or the whoever we're working for, you know? Because, um, yeah, you know, it, it's always a question that I want to ask. When, when people make laws and policies, I always want to ask, so who does this make life better for, you know? Um, I mean, who do you think you're doing this for? And if it's really, not for people who, who are most uh, in need of, of life being better, then I don't see the point, right? So um, I think that, yeah, I, I, we've had a few. I mean, I, I feel like, okay, we, we succeeded in some things, like getting the free treatment is one thing, getting uh, the harm reduction programs going is another thing. Um, with my work now, we, um, uh, we, we manage to, I think, we, well, we at least raise a lot of awareness about the family laws. Uh, women's groups, you know, they, they succeeded in getting the Domestic Violence Act out, uh, managed to change um, the, or reform the Marriage and Divorce Act uh, for non-Muslims, which made it much better for non-Muslim women. Unfortunately for Muslim women, it's been going the other way. Uh, so we, that's a constant struggle for us. Um, and there, there are lots of other, other um, laws uh, trying to now uh, promote a um, sexual harassment act uh, because there are many cases. And, and really violence against women is an ongoing issue. The other day I was interviewed because this woman uh, working in a government agency, working late, um, got attacked by a maintenance person. And suddenly it was a big hoo-ha, you know? Suddenly it was, whoa, because it happened to a, a civil servant, my God, you know? Um, and uh, she was viciously attacked, really viciously, because she was working late. And I must say the minister came out with some good um, a good response to it, and um, 
said, okay, we must put some safety measures uh, in place temporarily, but for the longer term, we have to educate people that this is not on at all. Violence against women is not on, and it's really something to see a man say that, yeah. You touched on a little bit already my next question, which is around what's the good news in terms of social activism? When we look at in the last 10, 20 years, because um, you have been at the forefront of a lot of this um, social activism activities, what's the good news? I think the good news is that nowadays you see a lot of, um, I mean, civil society is alive and well in Malaysia, you know. Uh, there's so many groups uh, interest groups, people just getting together to, to do things for society, whether it's to, you know, to feed the homeless or, or you know, do things for orphanages or charities or, or to, to bring up an issue um, to educate young people about the constitution or, I mean, there are just tons of things happening most of it I think, under the radar, but really good stuff, you know, and, and it's a way of kind of fighting back, you know, and, and I'm, I'm particularly keen and, and that's why I, I try and accept any request that students, um, you know, ask me, to invite me to, to go and speak to them because I, th I think they're really, really the hope, you know, um, because they're doing a lot of very interesting things and, and being very brave, you know. Um, I don't know whether you saw the latest thing, uh, these students came out um, saying that, you know, you got to get rid of, um, you know, Bumi Putra privileges. I thought, whoa, gosh, I wish them luck, you know, and I hope they keep safe. But it's very brave. You, it wouldn't have happened, you know, 10 years ago, never. Um, but you also get, you know, the there's always this issue that universities are very controlling of their students and wanting to, um, you know, limit what they can read, who can, who can talk to them. I've been, you know, banned five times from our local IPTAS. Um, <laughs> but they, they, they then, you know, do something about it. I mean, they, they, um, the group of students who were not allowed to read certain books in the university, so they decided to go into the park and set up their own reading group. Wow. Um, it's called Buku Jalanan, and it started off in uh, Shah Alam, so you know which university. Um, <laughs> and now there are Buku Jalanan branches, not only all over the country, but all over the world wow. among Malaysian students. Just students getting together to discuss books, to exchange books and things like that. You can't stop this. You just can't stop this. It's very short-sighted of university authorities, uh, especially in this day and age where people connect through social media, um, to try and, and stop people from thinking, um, you know. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm very, you know, very excited about the very, very many, 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 many um, civil society groups uh, that are being formed over all sorts of causes. And I think that's one of the reasons why we exist at Magic Social Entrepreneurship is, is as I go out and you know, engage with a lot of these social entrepreneurs, the amount of courage that they have, the determination to see change through and their resourcefulness to actually get things happening is incredible. And the only thing we could do is to back them 100%. Yeah, absolutely. and the great thing about young people is that they really have no fear. Mm. You know, and, and um, they just go ahead and do it mm. and then wait for something to happen, you know. Which brings me a bit of on the next question is around, do you, I, one of the things I did observe as well is that a lot of social entrepreneurs or change makers are predominantly young people. Is that true? Or well, more and more young people are becoming more involved in, in um, social activism? I think it's, it's probably true. Uh, because like I said they they are more willing to take risks. They, they, they you know they have no fear and all that. But also because they are much more internet savvy than you know older people, and therefore they connect uh, t with each other through it. it. It's you know you have a cause you want to push through. You just have to set up a Facebook page or 
whatever, and you connect with uh, people and you can do things. I know so many young people who are setting up internet businesses, and I mean, it's relatively easy compared to the old way where, you, you know, you, everything is physical, right? <laughs> Um, so, yeah, I, it's probably true, you know, uh, that it's mostly young people and, and it's great. And my last question is if you can leave our audience with three big advice when it comes to social activism, what would it be? Gosh, um, um, the, well, I don't know. I think, um, first of all, I think that you can't sort of decide that it's, you know, you want to do something and then start looking around. Um, I, I really think it's one of those things that just comes to you because if you're out there experiencing life and all that, I think you will then find a need and, and that's when you get the aha moment and, you know, you'll do it. I think if you you sort of think, oh, okay, I'm going to go out and do something. It very often doesn't come and then it becomes very frustrating. So I think you have to be open to all sorts of things and, and then you'll get the ideas. And, um, and secondly, I think just, just do it, you know. I mean, there I find a lot of people who sort of say, well, I want to do this, 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 but I got no money, no nothing. And, and many of these things don't really start with money. They start with intent. Uh, they start with commitment. They start with passion. And you just find ways, you know? I mean, people are always happy to support people who are really sincere and passionate about doing things. And, and it's, it's, I don't think it's that hard um, to, to get something uh, um, there, there's, as long as you have a good idea um, and, and really willing to see it through. And the third thing is see it through, I guess, you know. Um, don't give up. Um, there are ways uh, around things. So, you know, I find that if I don't know how to do anything, I just talk and talk and talk, talk about it <laughs> to anyone I meet and eventually someone uh, will turn up who says, oh, I can help you do that. Um, and, and I think maybe that's the fourth piece of advice is that sometimes people hold on to ideas and really protective of it and like, I don't want to tell anyone in case they steal my idea. <laughs> well, the thing is, you know, if your idea just stays in your head, it's not worth anything. And, and so, I, I, me, I prefer to, to just, just float it out there. And, and, and you, because most of my ideas are like social enterprise ideas, I really don't care if somebody else runs away with it. As long as they do it and it, it brings some good to someone, you know. They can have the name, it's okay, la, you know. I have no patent on it or anything. So, yeah, I think that's, that's the fourth. Captain <laughs> Paduka Marina Mahate. So, if I can summarize the, one of the three big lessons for me um, that come out of this whole conversation one is around um, education. So, not only education to bring awareness, but it's really for us to, to educate ourselves as well on the key issues that we want to be involved in, or even key issues that we find we're passionate about. Go talk to the people, go indulge yourself in those situations to build that empathy. Second one's around, um, sometimes things are not always straightforward. It's not A to B. It's A to Z to Q to R to S before it goes to B. Um, talk to the people parallel to you before you go to the top and work your way to where you need to get to. Um, and the third one is around, stick to your guns. Go ahead and do it. Um, but be sensitive about how you position and how you express things um, and, and make sure that you see th things through. And I just want to thank you again um, for making time, but more so as well as you talk about how more and more young people are becoming involved with social entrepreneurship. One of the things that I think we all could say is that um, for a lot of us young people, we are very lucky to have elders that comes before us who have paved... <laughs> the elders, not the elderly. Um, 
a lot of elders who come before us and actually pave the way so that we can have a, a better world. Um, and I want to thank you and thank a lot of you guys in the room working on social issues and environmental issues and making not only Malaysia a greater, greater nation, but also the world a better place. Thank you again, Marina. Thank you.